Well, eventually, the government caught up with him. And so he was arrested and he spent one night in jail. But, well, you know, he was a very famous person, very important back then. He was a man of letters. He lived in this beautiful little town of Concord, Massachusetts, very idyllic, surrounded by woods and lakes and stuff. And uh, where other important people, such as Ralph Waldo Emerson, also uh, uh, resided. And, and, and so one day the constable, the local constable, approached him and said, look, Mr. Thoreau, I'm very sorry, um, but I have to arrest you because you haven't paid taxes and I have an order to arrest you. And so he was, he was sent to jail for one night. The next morning someone came by and paid for Thoreau's dues and penalties and everything. He was out. Okay? But he had to confront the judge that one night. And, and, and the judge admired Thoreau. Uh, he was, again, he was a very famous person, man of letters. And, and so the judge said, look, Mr. Thoreau, I, 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 I'm truly sorry that I have to send you to jail. Um, you know, because I admire you so much. You're such a great man. We're so proud to have you in our town. In our town. But I have no option. What, what can I do? I have no option. And you know what Thoreau told the judge? He says, yes, you have an option. You can resign your office. And he tells us in here, bottom of page 35, what he told the judge. He says, if you really wish to do anything, resign your office. Well, you know what? When Mahatma Gandhi was fighting, struggling for the independence of India from Britain, when he was already famous and the crowds followed him and all this, um, once he was uh, taken by the police and he had to go to court and he faced a judge who, like in this case, told him, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, I truly admire you for what you're doing and I think you're great and admirable and, 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 and what can I say, but, um, you know, I'm forced by the law to send you to jail. I have no option. And you know what Gandhi told the judge? Exactly the same words. Right? Yes, you have an option. Resign your office, and you won't have to send me to prison. So he has inspired many people, and he has inspired Martin Luther King as well. And, and, and I, I hope you will read the excerpts from his letter from a Birmingham jail that you have in, in your Moodle page, okay? in which you will see also the inspiration from this natural law idea in his own discourse. Um, now we're going to go to page 241, in which he explains uh, his position more in detail as to why he refused to pay taxes. He says, I have never declined paying the highway tax because I am as desirous of being a good neighbor as I am of being a bad subject. I want as much to be a good person as I want to be a bad citizen. Pretty strong statement, huh? He sees both things so incompatible, as being so incompatible, that he says, I want to be a good person, which means I have to be a bad citizen. So I want both things at the same time, to be a good person and a bad citizen. And as for supporting schools, I am doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen now. It is for no particular item in the tax bill that I refuse to pay it. it sim I simply wish to refuse allegiance to the state, to withdraw and stand aloof from it effectually. I do not care to trace the course of my dollar, if I could, till it buys a man or a musket or to shoot one with. The dollar is innocent, but I am concerned to trace the effects of my allegiance. In fact, I quietly, re I quietly declare war with the state after my fashion, though I will still make what use and get what advantage of her I can, as is usual in such cases. If you were to say these words to a politician, to a legislator, or to a you know, a legally minded person, you know, I am at war with the state. I declare war on the state. 
what, what kind of an answer would you get from them? This kind of initial answer. Well, they'd probably tell you, okay, fine, you're at war with the state, you want nothing to do with the state, you don't want to pay taxes, fine. But if that's the case, don't use any of the services the state offers to you, right? Don't, don't use our freeways, don't use running water, don't use any of, of the services that are paid for with your taxes. What is, what is Thoreau's answer to that? I am at war with the state and I am going to use everything the state offers me in my war against the state. Because that's what you do when you're at war. So you invade Iraq, you don't go, oh, I'm not going to take any of Saddam Hussein's institutions, TV or anything because they, they belong to the enemy. No, you take over all of the institutions so as to control your enemy's territory. Okay? So well, that's what Thoreau says he's going to do in his war against the state. Um, now we go to page 245. The authority of government, even such as I am willing to submit to, for I will cheerfully obey those who know and can do better than I, and in many things even those who can neither know nor can do so well, is still an impure one. So he's saying, okay, I will obey some kind of government, even though it's impure, because in order to be strictly just, a government must have the sanction and consent of the governed. It can have no pure right over my person and property, but what I concede to it, the progress from an absolute to a limited monarchy, from a limited monarchy to a democracy, is a progress toward a true respect for the individual. And now he ends his essay with a really substantial question, which is a valid one even today. Is democracy, such as we know it, the last improvement possible in government? Is it not possible to take a step forward towards recognizing and organizing the rights of men? There will never be a really free and enlightened state until the state comes to recognize the individual as a higher and independent power from which all its own power and authority are derived and treats him accordingly. Okay, now let's do a critique of Thoreau and his ideas. They seem very appealing, um, but at the same time, they appear to be really impracticable, impossible to put in practice, okay? and especially with large populations such as we have in the US or other countries. If you have a really tiny country with small communities, perhaps something like this could be workable. Um, I must say that when Thoreau was writing this, he was not being fully original. He was not writing this completely out of the blue, like no one was saying these things. Other people were saying these things. Okay, he's writing in the early 19th century, and that is the time of a, a cultural current called Romanticism. And at the time, you know, if you have, I'm sure you heard of Lord Byron and other such romantic figures, well, these kinds of ideas um, were common currency. Rousseau, a French thinker of the 18th century, had already proposed this kind of small community democracy. And so he was not being fully original. Uh, he was, in a sense, expressing ideas which were somehow in the air during his time. It's a very different thing to say something like this in a completely hostile environment in which people would look at you and think you're crazy, or to say these things when you know there is this applauding minority, minor, uh, uh, I don't know whether majority, but this audience which is happy to hear those ideas and who, who, find, who are supportive of, of you. Uh, so that is thorough in context. 
Of course, Thoreau uh, was also, uh, as I said, a, an important man in his time. He was a man of letters. By the time he wrote this, he was already famous. So in a sense, he could afford making these statements and, and doing what he did. Whether uh, just a common man in the street could really afford doing these things, not pay taxes and, and be so openly, so openly rebellious, that's a different question, I think. Still, um, his ideas have inspired many people and groups of people and individuals who were neither powerful nor famous. So, you know, his, his contribution is uh, really important to, to the American um, philosophical tradition and cultural tradition. Already runs, I should say, so counter this central notion in American culture and society that the most important thing is the law, to respect the law, never to break the law. But even within that element in culture, or with that element in American culture, here you have a complete radical breakup with that idea, which is also an integral part of American um, American culture, American society. Thank you.